Oh. I just lost your sound. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. For a second. I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, she was talking to me, Say, please note that your storage is almost full. Please log in and, and delete some recordings. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Am I logged in? Oh, no. Much better. Oh. oh, you mean your video and audio? Oh, yes. <laughs> video, audio, and um, opening up Notepad now uh, doesn't slow yeah. everything down. Mm-hmm. Notepad slowed things down? Notepad slowed things down on my old computer. Oh, my goodness. That, that's, uh, that's hideous. <laughs> I'm glad I upgraded. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Let me get to this screen again. There we go. Because I have to delete or else we, we will not be able to finish this recording. Understood. History and recordings. Critical infrastructures, February 20th. Cross-site scripting. Okay, let me find anything with recordings. And I've deleted. Recordings, huh? I'm going to get rid of the presidential transition one. Oh, well. I, I was very proud of that one. <laughs> but I've already saved it locally. So... Okay, so you are saving these locally where you can use them in the future. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 CS Sensei. Scotty, thoughts and feelings about a YouTube channel? Um, It's good if you uh, are interested in uh, becoming known. Um, I find the, the biggest challenge with a YouTube channel is staying focused. Uh, uh, you, you will find lots of people out there have a YouTube channel for this, and then they have a spin-off YouTube channel for this, and then they have a spin-off YouTube channel for this. Um, so the most important thing is not to be Chris Oxford, but to be the person, you know, the channel that you come to for this topic. Um, and then, you know, actually create a YouTube channel specifically for that and and stay focused on that. So it's not necessarily it's good for like a video storage thing or oh, just kind of keep it. It, it. it works so long as you are doing one, one way storage because you won't be able to bring it back down and use it again. Hmm. Uh, it, it stores it in some weird flash format, highly compressed. And you can't download it after that. That's bizarre. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this says, let me do a refresh, make sure that I'm... Okay, 500 megs available. Good. All right, so... Um, uh, don't know who's going to be on, us, on with us this morning. Um, the two individuals that uh, did... Uh, join this week. I think they both work on Saturdays, but that will allow us the opportunity to record and, and have a playback. Um, so uh, the I think the first thing that we need to do here is sort of lay the groundwork for what we're doing uh, as a the CS Sensei group, and you know let's let's just start with the name. Why are we called Sensei? Do, 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 do. Where's my Google Drive? I thought I had my Google Drive up. Yep, there it is. Slide decks. Um, so, uh, in reference to this, and uh, you've seen this before, Chris, but um, I'm sort of honing my skills for my next presentation. So, tell me anything that we need to, to uh, sort of make it more focused or drop it all together. Uh, sensei, uh, a lot of people think of Sensei in reference to martial arts. And Sensei is the guy up front that's yelling at you, you know, hit him harder. <laughs> um, but uh, in truth, Sensei is a, a traditional Japanese word that means one who goes before. In other words, somebody who's been a little bit further along than you have. A Sensei is not usually considered to be a master, but somebody who is further along than you are, along the same path. So uh, think about it as, as somebody who's ahead of you, not necessarily, you know, the answer to everything. 
uh, you know, a lot of again, a lot of folks in in white outfits think that sensei means the ultimate, but that's not true. Sensei is just somebody who's ahead of you. Uh, in that respect, everyone in this group can can be part of a mentor. In other words, they have particular skills, particular experiences that the others don't. So everybody can participate and add to a mentorship group that is focused on the sensei idea rather than everybody come and sit around the campfire and Scotty will tell you a story about cybersecurity. That's not what this is. And, I, and you've heard me say this. This is not the Scotty Ward show. This is not the Chris Oxford show. This is, you know, we've been through this. We can help you understand things that you should focus on, things that you probably should stay away from, etc., cetera, um, for your own career. But your career is in your hands. Compared to training, because you know people contact me and say, hey, you've got training. No, I don't. I've got a mentorship group. And the difference is that training helps you achieve, for example, training for the... Um, Security Plus, the 601 Security Plus exam, help you achieve certification in that exam. And once you get that certification, training's done. They don't care what you do with it. You can then, you know, go scuba diving with it for all they care. They have accomplished their training, which was to help you achieve a particular goal. Yeah. Um, the difference is there are lots of people, and I presume there are, you know, thousands of people out there that have gone through the, let's say, Security Plus exam training, have taken the exam, have gotten their credential in the form of a certification, and then they say, great, I'm going to apply for a job. And they go to a job uh, interview, and somebody says, you know, what's your experience? Well, I have certification. Okay, what's your experience? Well, I have you know, I, I took this certification exam and I got this certification training in. Okay, what's your experience? I, I read Google News, <laughs> you know, and, and that's as far as it goes. What um, people are looking for is, yes, the skills, but also the demonstrated mindset. Somebody who has, an, uh, has developed the mindset that matches your potential interviewers and your potential supervisors mindset and I give this as my example if somebody says in an interview and you and I both know this question comes up what keeps you up at night what they're looking for is your knowledge of current events and how current events weigh against what you would consider to be an acceptable security posture and then how to help make those match. In other words, what, what, you know, if I, if I hear what goes on about, you know, Bank of XYZ and I own a bank, I should immediately focus on what was done here that might be a risk here. And if so, how do I address it so I myself don't become front page news on the Washington Post? So, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody who has that strategic knowledge, who has those same sensitivities in mind, not just somebody who's passed a certification exam. So in this mentorship, we talk about this. We've been involved in, well, you, Chris, with your Capture the Flag groups. Um, I've been, and you may or may not know this, but I've been on the red team at Department of Labor for, not red team, Tiger team, Every time there's a security incident that involves ops and they need someone from the service desk, they call me and I run upstairs and I sit in the, well, until last year when I moved over, but I was the one that was the um, operational support desk representative because they would say, blah, 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 and I'd know exactly what that meant. I'd know exactly what the ESD's role was in being able to address that or do research or run down the hall and, and snag somebody's laptop with a replacement or, or whatever. They didn't have to turn to me and say, Scotty, I want you to go do this and go do this and tell these people this. And I was already 
formulating notifications. I was already working on reports to management. I was already saying this is going to take a resource commitment over here because this is what they're going to ask us next. Could you go get these 30 laptops? Yes. Do we have uh, backup laptops for it? Well, we do here and here, but we don't here. How do you know? Well, I just asked them. And of course, I knew what they were going to ask, so I formulated the answer before they asked. So whenever we'd have a red team, the, the ESOC chief, in, that, in this case it was David Smith, would say, get Scotty up here. Um, so that's what they're looking for. They're looking for someone with the mindset who has the strategic awareness of where you fit in the story. I'm going to tell one, one real quick story, and hopefully you've heard this. If not, it's a, just a great career coaching discussion. But uh, it goes back to medieval England. And there's this, you know, squire riding along at his horse, and he goes up to a stone quarry. And it's the stone quarry for a cathedral. And they're, they're over there cutting rocks and shaping them and all this sort of thing. And he goes to the first guy and he says, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm making rocks this big by this tall, by this deep. I'm making sure the edges are very straight and so that it'll fit into another one. And that's what I'm doing. I'm making rocks so that they'll stack one on another. And he said, okay. And he went to the second guy and he said, what are you doing? And the second guy said, I'm building a cathedral. He, they were doing exactly the same activities, but the second gentleman understood what he was doing in the larger activity of building a cathedral. The exact same work, but what drives you? Oh, I want to make this edge straight. I want to make this rock to where it stacks on top of this rock. No, I want a cathedral that doesn't have wind blowing through it from a draft. <laughs> you know, that's the, and it doesn't fall down. Um, that's the point. You have to understand why cybersecurity is out there and where you fit in the, the larger cybersecurity role. So, um, again, uh, uh, going back to our uh, sensei, sorry, I'm jumped off on about three different tangents there. Um, we are all on the same path, but some of us are a little further on than others. The point of this is to help you develop the mindset of a service provider, not to train you to pass an exam. That can be done by self-study, that can be done by um, any sort of, of testing or whatever. You can take a training course online. Uh, we do recommend, you know, you and I have put numerous courses out there that people can take for as little as $69. We've also shown YouTube videos that can get them started for zero. Yes. The actual study for your exam is only part of the role. The other thing is, what do you do with it and why? Another thing nice about doing it this way, Scotty, is as you get to further along and more advanced certification exams, for example, the CISSP, a lot of the exams are not, and, and they call it Bloom's Taxonomy. There's level one, level two. A right. lot of the core CompTIAs are level one, level two, or, and then you get up to the level fours. And fours. Yep. Three and fours. Uh, CISSP is written, and, and I read this a lot in the reviews, is mm -hmm. management type test. It's not a, uh, oh, what is a, what, what does zero trust mean? No, they give you a scenario and you have to think strategically of what would be the best path in the right selection and the, the right selection because any, any of the answers, two or three of them, could be correct. But right. there's, there's that key part that says what is the best answer? Yep. And you have to think strategically and as a manager versus, oh, I know this, okay. Zero trust is the correct answer. Kind of situation. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is an excellent point, Chris, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, so here's the Bloom's taxonomy. It used to, be, used to be in a shape of a flower. Get it, Bloom? Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so you start at the bottom, and this is level one, two, three, four, five, six, and that hasn't changed uh, since it was the flower shape. Uh, but uh, remember and understand our 
you know, what is a firewall? And what does it do and why do you need it? Well, that's one and two. But then, um, and you were talking about it, um, three and four is where you get into applying it. Where do you need firewalls? Um, do we need a firewall? That is not covered under Bloom's Taxonomy 1 and 2. Do you need a firewall? Um, all you can do with 1 and 2, and I fully agree, Security Plus is definitely 1 and 2. They do have some situational questions where they say, you're in the middle of this and this is occurring and you see this, you know, what do you do or what are you missing or, or those sorts of things. But again, those are the, the steps, uh, etc., not actual analysis of a situation or um, determining what's missing, etc. Uh, so I, I think that's a great idea. I find they, that the capture to flag, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the, no, you're good. Cap, the capture to flag in the competitions that I participated in, um, the cybersecurity challenges, mm -hmm. uh, they apply the analysts, apply, evaluate more top level than the understand, remember part. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Think on your feet. Mm -hmm. Think on your feet. Um, they they took out one word. Yeah, they took out one word that I think uh, helps to really gel the whole taxonomy when you get up into five and six, mm -hmm. um, and especially six. The word they use or they used to use is synthesis. In other words, you take mm -hmm. all of your knowledge, you take all of your analysis, and then you synthesize things like a solution or a strategy or tactics or whatever. Like, for example, let, let's say you are the ESOC chief, uh, Enterprise Security Operations Center. You have a particular incident. Who needs to be in there when you have that incident for your Tiger team? Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't learn that. You, you have to have learned all of the roles. You have to learn their interrelationships. You have to learn, have already learned about the enterprise. You have to know about all the various interrelated um, hardware, software, service components so that you can say, I need someone with this knowledge. This particular team has this knowledge. Call the branch chief for this group and have them send somebody because I need somebody with that particular knowledge here in this call you know so that is the synthesis that is where you say um, are we prepared to go to a zero trust security model yes or no um, you know the the synthesis and I use that word a lot because it's from everything you come up with something more you come up with something new that's synthesis so and they got rid of it it's not here anymore, but that my favorite word synthesis. <laughs> so yeah, your your point is uh, well taken, Chris. Um, for for first timers trying to get entry level positions, they're going to be focusing on uh, remembering things, understanding things. For example, in the uh, Security Plus uh, study guides, all of them I'm sure, they talk about ports and protocols. What port is it TCP or UDP? What service is it used for? Is it unidirectional or bidirectional? Um, and and that sort of thing. Uh, then they talk about um, uh, hashing and and the various encryption and decryption and and those sorts of things. Those are on charts. Why? Because they are straight remembering. What is an MD5 hash? What is a CRC? You know, those sorts of things. Those are base level that will get you through your uh, Security Plus exam. But then if you get to your CISSP, they're going to say, why do you need it? What's the big deal? Oh, here's an email system. What do you think they're using for their hash, for their encryption, for their um, handshake protocols, you know? Handshake, what's that? That's where you learn it back in Security Plus. You know, you, you just can't jump to your CISSP. And I've seen people try. And, and they do horribly if they don't have that foundational stuff.
Um, oh, you know, I, good, I get why they jump to the CISSP. A lot of the oh, sure. entry-level, quote-unquote, cybersecurity jobs are saying, hey, I want CISSP, I want this many-level experience, but there's no application or beef or teeth toward, and I'm sorry if I'm using uh, okay. these terms, but um, a lot of the employers, when they go to interview, very rare you get an employer that says, hey, you're a CISSP, what do you think? You're about hired. It? You're hired. It is, it's, it's, you're, you have a CISSP. Oh, you have a CISSP. I like you. I want you. Right. That's Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this is a little, not exactly on topic, but um, you remember the old MCSE, Microsoft mm -hmm. Certified Systems mm -hmm. Engineering mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. it used to be called. Yep. Um, right around the year 2002, mm -hmm. uh, a year after 9-11, I was hiring to uh, scale up Donald Rumsfeld's team, and I was looking for an um, engineer, an actual systems engineer. And so I said, you know, minimum MCSE. But then there's a lot to add to that. One guy showed up and I said, you know, what's your experience? He said, well, I have an MCSE. I said, okay, how did you get the MCSE? He said, self-study. I said, okay, so what have you done with it? He said, I built a LAN in my basement. I'm like, okay, um, what else? He said, that's it. <gasps> that's it. He had no experience, but he went out, got his MCSE, what was it, six exams or something for that, and he used that to build a LAN in his own basement, you know, with old computers and, and virtual machines and all that sort of thing. You know, that that's laudatory, but that, do, that did not give me the... Um, satisfaction of knowing I was hiring someone who knew what to do. In this particular situation, we need to do this. He had never been in a live, you know, uh, to use the, the boot camp terminology, he'd never been under live fire. So you were saying, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm surprised he didn't give like a story like, you know, if I was in his shoes, yeah, I built a home lab, but hey, I found this really nasty worm on my home network just by building my home lab. Hey, here's what I did to uh, get rid of this really yep. nasty worm. From what I learned, so yeah, I think yep. that would have uh, sold you. If you can make a nice five-minute story about it. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, you can you can point out um, common sense mm -hmm. at any point, and, and it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that goes to um, uh, particular triggers, particular skills, um, the intermeshing of skills. In other words, uh, like they say in, in the video you brought up, you've got, why do you start as an auditor? Because then you know what it takes to run your organization's um, security infrastructure. Why? Because it's in writing. You must do this. You must have this. You must. This must be in place at this level of, of complexity, or else you are not sufficient. You know, auditing is boring, like he said. But by the time you're done, anybody's going to say, "If I need to know what we have to do next, I'm going to ask him." Outside the video, there's a huge mind map chart of all the things that are related to cybersecurity. If I find it, I'm going to put it on the uh, Facebook group okay. to show everybody, but not now. I'm not, let's not search for it now. Let's okay. Continue. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Um, I did want to cover a couple of the basics that we have here. Um, uh, we have what's called a code of ethics, and for those who are unfamiliar with it, they may ask themselves why. You know, why, what's the big deal about a code of ethics? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, the, the point is that in the cybersecurity arena, you could literally be training the good guys and the bad guys in the exact same classes. The only difference between those two is that the good guys, we'll call them the white hats, are those who are doing this to help ensure that the people they work for or the infrastructures they support are implemented and um, have the highest level of security against 
those who sit in the same class and learn how to exploit vulnerabilities. Okay, so the the code of ethics basically says we are going to operate ethically, we are going to operate legally, we are going to operate in the best interests of our uh, career field, we're going to operate, um, we are not going to disclose information about our employers. You don't go in, you know, like I, I mentioned, we now have somebody from Bank of America in our mentorship group, so I have to drop all my Bank of America horror stories. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, I can't. It would not be ethically correct to have somebody come in from, I don't care, I, I use this one all the time, Toys R Us, um, and complain about the Toys R Us network infrastructure or their point of sale systems or whatever. Not good. You can um, speak about things generally, but you can't say, this organization that I work for has this vulnerability and it really sucks because they won't address it. You do that here, you are opening up, uh, you, you are literally pointing at your infrastructure saying hit them there. So the code of ethics helps everyone understand that we have a um, base level of ethical approach in what we are learning here. We are not learning how to crash a network. We are not learning how to exploit vulnerabilities. We are learning what exploits are out there. We are learning what vulnerabilities are there. And then we are learning how to close the circle on that so it doesn't occur to our teams, our infrastructures, our employers. And that's the difference. The Code of Ethics says, and uh, I'll just zip down here and show it. Uh, Act legally with honor, responsibility, and honesty as I implement the knowledge and continue to gain. Now, the, I've gained and continue to gain. So the code of ethics says we will operate ethically. And if uh, you know this, but for those that uh, are just looking at this for the first time, our code of ethics is taken heavily from the CISSP, from CISA, or ISC2, ISC2's code of ethics for the CISSP. Um, uh, another one that, uh, making sure that we have time for this, weekly assignments. What are, what's a big deal about homework? Well, the, the homework is that if you are just coming here and thinking that one hour a week talking is going to get you a job, you're mistaken. We are here to help. We are help to, here to encourage. We are help to we help to bring information to this forum, but what we are also doing is we're trying to help everybody understand that you need to have a directed focus and mindset while you're developing this. And that mindset doesn't stop when this session ends. You have to be looking at, let's say, Google News, uh, you know, whatever, Yahoo News, uh, Bloom, Bloomberg's, uh, Bleeping Computer, ZDNet, uh, Computer World, any of those. Um, and then there are obviously more in-depth ones. But when you're looking at something, uh, and I will tell you, when I bring up news.google.com, I look at you know the big national stuff, and then I zip down to the cybersecurity. I have already focused Google News to look for cybersecurity articles. Stuff that tends to break their threshold is stuff that my prospective employer is going to see as well. They're going to see other stuff, but I want to at least make sure that I am seeing the same things they do. So that when they turn around and they say, what keeps you up at night? I want to be able to respond with the same things that keep them up at night. Mm -hmm. So the weekly assignments are designed to help you take your focus out into the world. Look at the stuff in the world from a cybersecurity perspective. And the, the biggest example I give, and you know, you, you've heard me, I've got like four or five movies that I consider to be foundational for um, uh, learning about information assurance and cybersecurity. Uh, one of them is Sneakers, Sneakers with Robert Redford. Uh, 
Um, there's one guy that they're trying to get information on him uh, because they want to learn how he does, you know, some of the stuff he does. So they go pull his trash cans and they take everything out of his trash can and dump it in the middle of their living room and the three, I think it was three of them, are going through looking at things and they're saying, hmm, hmm, what about this? Oh, here's a piece of paper or here, you know, whatever. And they are taking these little bits and reassembling them into this is the person. Um, it's called dumpster diving and yes, it does occur very frequently. Well, what's the big deal? Whatever you throw away could indicate what you're doing, what you're working on, what you're focused on. That's why everybody shreds. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but um, shredding, even shredding, you need a high quality shredder. Because if you ever watched, I think it was called Argo, the um, uh, movie about the uh, Iranian embassy, and I saw it on that movie, I think it was called Argo, where they overran the Iranian embassy. And those folks that were there were, you know, running their paper through shredders. But they were running it through not only um, classified certified shredders, but they were running it through whatever shredders they had. Mm -hmm. And they were cutting very, very thin strips of paper, yep. sheet length paper. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just give that as an example. The whole length, slice, 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 slice. So what occurred is, and, and, you know, this did occur, they grabbed a whole bunch of kids with little pieces of board and, and they did a, a st strip of um, string across this board and then they started to take all of these pieces of paper in these bags and set them side by side and say, did these originally belong together? And these kids reassembled security documents that, that had classification on them to learn things about what the United States government was doing with the Iranian embassy. Mm -hmm. Classified document reconstruction by going into their trash, pulling out this old stuff, understanding that you can lay your strips side by side and say, oh, that's a J, yep. you know. And, and they reassembled classified documents. So now you have to have a certain width and cross cut. So you're making it, you know, thousands of times more difficult to do that. You need a whole lot of kids with a whole lot of strings to do that. And a burn um, room. Or a burn room, right. <laughs> so the, the, the point is that you learn that by watching movies. <laughs> You learn that by looking at stuff out in the real world and saying, what are the security implications of this? So that's what these assignments are for. They're not for you to go somewhere and, you know, learn stuff and bring it back to me and say, ooh, look what I have. Mm -hmm. It is for you to look at it and go, wow, I never thought about that. Because that helps you sharpen your mindset toward a cybersecurity, an information assurance, a risk analysis perspective, because that's what's going to get you hired. You're going to go into your job interview and your potential employer is going to ask things, not what is the port for SMTP? Because that's on your Security Plus exam. Is it unidirectional or bidirectional? You know, they're not going to do that. They're going to say, what do you do when you encounter this? Or, we just had this occur, and we did this. What would you have done differently? So you've got to be able to do big picture analysis. And one of the best places to do that, honestly, is watching videos. See how other people do it. Uh, you will, among other things, you'll notice why certain media activities or information uh, can be trusted, but only so far. But only so far. You know, the Yahoo security or whatever, they will say XYZ occurred. 
and they'll say this occurred um, it affected you know this group and they expect to pay this much money or whatever those are the headlines but what you want to know is much more intricate how was the attack done what was researched before um, uh, how long did these groups spend researching this thing before they actually pulled the trigger on the attack that's what you want to know you want to know how the attack um, was researched what occurred w while it was in play and not just what did it cost them but how did this particular group um, address it in the future and what is the industry now suggesting to help make sure that everybody's safe that's what you're going to have in your job interview so be aware that you learn that by looking at you know reading articles yes um, but also watching movies this is going to ruin <laughs> we'll say this this is going to ruin you and your entertainment value when you're watching new movies you're gonna look at stuff and say oh that doesn't happen no they're not supposed to do this they're supposed to do this that's good because you're now thinking professionally when you're looking at a particular um, uh, uh, movie or media event or YouTube video or whatever good morning Douglas good to have you good morning. hi everyone hey uh, we're talking about our assignments here just researching and, and rehearsing why we do the assignments so um, okay. in, in every case um, I want the assignments to be from the form of a lesson learned what I mean by a lesson learned and I think that's important because two of these three talk about lessons learned what went well what didn't go well and what changes might they do or should we do to make sure that that doesn't happen again so a lesson learned could be they did this which was a good thing by you know having um, active backups they kept themselves from having to reconstruct six months of data and only had to re reconstruct one week or something like that that's a lesson learned what worked well what didn't work well the fact that they for example they didn't do a, a thorough background investigation on this guy who had you know a, a criminal record for you know uh, breaking into banks or, or whatever you know the guy was tried for extortion or something like that that's what didn't work well in other words what worked what didn't work and then the last one is examine all of that and say should we do anything and, and you got to be careful not to do this reflexively because you'll go chasing after solutions because guess what all of the service providers and and app developers are looking at the same articles and saying "Ooh, look our little XYZ tool this will answer this question so they then start advertising on YouTube and you know wherever your your searches are going on Facebook you'll start seeing ads mm -hmm. they'll pop up because they've just financed additional ads based on what you just read be careful about that you have to do, have a critical eye to it and say does this apply is this the best approach don't trust your vendors don't trust your vendors there they want to sell it to you they think they're best you have to agree with them before you start shelling out money so a lesson learned should always be your approach and uh, you know I just said uh, current events number one or entertainment watching a movie watch um, war games watch sneakers watch um, the KGB the CIA and me or KGB the computer in me with Clifford Stoll um, watch you know the one that I like recently is red the movie red because they they break into the CIA supposedly are you and, uh, what's that like the color red the movie red with Bruce yeah, Willis like right. the color red, red, red yeah. is in color R E D okay. yeah okay. and and it's a it's a made-up word you know they stamp this guy's um, uh, 
HR record, his personnel record with R.E.D. And what they said was retired, extremely dangerous. So obviously uh, that's just made up. But um, the point is in red, there are a lot of things where, uh, well, I'll, I'll give an example. They say, we need to break into the CIA. Well, how do we do that? Well, let's go ask the Russians. <laughs> so he walked into the Russian embassy and uh, said, you know, I, I want your codes. I want to, you know, I want your stuff. And the guy's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's beyond my capability. And the very next scene, here's Bruce Willis going into the CIA. So obviously uh, in this movie, in this particular situation, Bruce Willis went to the right person who had the right information, who immediately denied that he had it, but then obviously presented it to him. So um, that's the entertainment value that you get out of this. What would be, and I, I'm just going to give a, a great uh, question here, just popped into my mind. If you're looking for how to break into, oh gosh, I don't know, let's say um, Norfolk Southern Railroad's computer system, what do you think is one of the best ways to find out um, how to do that? The dark web, probably. Be more specific. When going to the dark web has a lot of people, a lot of groups that are sharing information among them, bad guys. Uh huh. So I think that could be a starting point. Okay. Before the dark or web. Like, oh, go ahead, Doug. Oh uh, no, I was just going to add to it that uh, I don't know where there there is a manual supposedly in the CIA that says the 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 enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, you were going to say? Uh, before I even touch the dark web, uh, I would look at Norfolk Southern's website first, figure out who they are, who their industry is, and what, what do, their phone numbers, find any staff directories, anything I can find to kind of say, hey, uh, who can contact. Second thing I would try would be LinkedIn. Um, or Facebook. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure people love to put where they work uh, yep. uh, because they want a job, but also uh, because they're, uh, I'll be keep quiet and say they're probably a little bit <laughs> interesting to share that information about mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, now, now, you're exactly where I was going to go with this, Chris, but what would you look for on LinkedIn? Uh, manager, president, uh, who else? A worker? Uh, mm, More specifically. Da, 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 da. Uh, anybody in IT would be interesting. Okay. Who else? More specifically. You're on uh, the right track. Former workers. Workers. Interesting. Hmm. I used to work at Norfolk Southern, but mm -hmm. I quit because I got ticked off at the way they do X, Y, Z, or they didn't pay me enough or whatever, I forgot the other you're, scenario. you're looking to try and find disgruntled workers who don't care about Norfolk Southern anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they will gladly hand you stuff. Sure, I, I hated my boss. He, you know, he bumped into my car in the parking lot. <laughs> it, it really doesn't matter. What you're looking for is somebody who has been with Norfolk Southern and knows how they operate who doesn't mind sharing it with you because they don't care. They, they're bound under no non-disclosure agreement. They have no uh, ethical motives. They're just sort of like, yeah, they sucked. I mean, you know, they've got this great, you know, key system to get into the buildings, but, you know, you can always go in the cafeteria entrance because it's not keyed. <laughs> oh, what's that, Chris? Uh-huh. It's a good book. It's Social Engineering. It's from Chris Hadnagy, uh -huh. and that actually how I got the initial idea. It goes mm -hmm. into how to do open source intelligence work, yep. and first part is research. And, do you, and he quotes it very well um, with, if people put it on the Internet, it's fair game. And yep. you, it, it's a good way to dumpster dive, uh, quote, unquote, dumpster dive virtually. Dumpster dive electronically, yeah. yeah. And he goes through the whole strategy of open source intelligence. I'll go ahead and post a link on Facebook. And we can continue that's, from that's there. That's good. I appreciate mm -hmm. that, Chris. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so th that's what I'm trying to say. Um, use your resources, good or bad, 
you know, if somebody was trying to uh, find out, for example, um, who uh, knew about the post 9-11 networking infrastructure that was rebuilt, they might take a look at my LinkedIn um, profile and say, oh yeah, he was there, he did this, and you know, might want to approach me for it. Well, we're talking DOD, so um, DOD reinvents itself very frequently. Uh, and they do that for a very good reason. They are considered to be some of the best. I mean, when they stood up Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security, they used DOD structures, you know, and, and NSA. Those were the two. DOD and NSA formed Homeland Security. Very quick solar wind story. Mm -hmm. They, first off, it was found, from my understanding, was found by Microsoft at first but other people knew about it that include NSA DHS and one of the Microsoft one of the Microsoft folks go they knew something we didn't know and that called the term throughout the whole infosec community of these guys know more than you know so you probably should listen to them if they say you have a problem right mm -hmm. right I have so, a question regarding that, but later on when, when we're through that. Uh, okay, let me, let me finish up the assignments, and, sure. and then we'll go straight to that. Um, the third assignment, again, the first two are uh, something in the news. Second one is something in entertainment. Look at them both from a, an information assurance or cybersecurity perspective, and look at it from the form in the form of a lesson learned. That's very important because frequently and that's why I was saying you got to be careful when people put stuff out on news outlets what they're trying to do is make the information sticky enough juicy enough to where you're gonna want to click on it and read it why so they get advertising revenue the, so th they are not a hundred percent pure in what they're trying to tell you they craft it to make it interesting Oh, clickbait. Mm. Yeah, that is, that as well. So, well, yeah, Doug, but the, the point is they want to make it to where you say, ooh, this is neat, I'm going to come back. You know, these mm -hmm. guys definitely, you know, they tell, they tell a great story. If you've ever read Wired Magazine's mm -hmm. uh, articles, they are designed to draw you in and keep you there. Yeah. I've been reading Wired for 15 years. Um, so the, the point is they, they try and write to make it interesting to you, which may or may not emphasize key critical points about a particular uh, activity or research or a cyber attack uh, that you need to know. So don't just rely on those. Start with those and then go out into the industry and start looking for people who are talking about those things. The, uh, the water treatment plant hack that occurred a few weeks ago, um, that was a buzz in the industry, uh, critical infrastructure protection, et cetera. So they, they were just going crazy with that one. And I think I mentioned this, a couple weeks before that, I read about how water production, water treatment, water disposal, is considered a critical infrastructure, but everywhere they are underspending on it. And then two weeks later, somebody gets hit. Amazing. So, um, and the last uh, thing that I want everybody to do in your assignments is find a resource that you can share with the other members of this team. That's the reason why we do it. In other words, if you see something and you think it's valuable, bring it back to the team because we will probably think it's valuable as well. You help your cybersecurity mentor team here get better because you found something and brought it back. Okay? It, it's not just the Chris and Scotty show. I keep saying that over and over and over again. Um, yes, we're out there. Yes, we're wandering. Yes, we're looking. But when we see something, for uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, first I th thing I think of is, would this work for the Sensei team? It, is there value in this? Sometimes it's too complex. Yep. But sometimes you say, wow, 
we were just talking about this or or this is a great topic for us to move to next so keep an eye out for those sorts of things just a farmer throwing seeds <laughs> yep yep so you were, you were going to say next Doug well no, I had a, a couple of questions uh, one, one is more of a comment um, interestingly related to that uh, that bridge that Russian bridge uh, into solar winds and then through the whole system their customers okay. Okay. Um, I think and I hope that they do I mean it was very uh, I hope that they do something about it because I think that was very uh, unprofessional on their part not do I mean have been doing jobs related to their you know to their customers related to their customer security system but they didn't upgrade their own uh, systems and that's you know they, they exploded those vulnerabilities uh, so I think they bear a lot of responsibility in that sense um, mm -hmm. uh, you mean solar I, winds yeah okay. and I recently saw something that I forgot to share with the group I'm going to share it after the meeting because okay. um, I found something on the government on justice, justice .gov. Uh, the the vision's priorities and it lists six of them I think five or six and pandemic related fraud opioids blah 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 the final one the two final ones five and six are telehealth and cybersecurity and regarding cybersecurity and this is what called my attention it says notably both of the last two areas electronic health records and telemedicine reflect the increasingly importance of technology to the healthcare system. Our growing reliance on technology is not limited, of course, to the healthcare arena, and thus neither are fraud schemes involving the development and use of technology. For example, cybersecurity-related fraud may be another area where we could see an enhanced False Claims Act activity. With mm -hmm. the growing threat of cyber attacks, federal agencies are relying heavily on robust cybersecurity protections to safeguard our vital governmental data and information to the extent that the government pays for systems and I think they're referring here to SolarWinds and other providers to the extent that the government pays for systems or services that purport to comply with required cybersecurity standards but fail to do so it is not difficult to imagine a situation for False Claims Act liability may arise yes that one thing. Um, that, yeah, um, you, it can get even simpler than that. For example, what about Microsoft Office? Office 365 is cloud-based, mm -hmm. which includes Exchange. Mm -hmm. So many organizations are now using cloud-based email systems, and out in the cloud, you are relying on Microsoft to provide that level of security um, that can't be, you know, uh, uh, impacted by a, a cyber attack. Same thing with network services. Amazon Web Services is another good one. You are putting, for example, it could be critical information out there, mission information, could be a patent, trademark information, um, uh, corporate strategy, uh, you could be putting financial information up there. You could be putting pre-decisional contract information. In other words, we're about to award this contract to this company, so somebody you know catches that and goes and buys all sorts of stock because they know the company's stock is going to jump. You know, uh, all of that is uh, you have a reliance that that particular provider is going to use best practices and ensure that your data is safe. But mm -hmm. are they? Do they? Yeah, you've got a good point, Doug. And uh, the, the other thing I was going to, this is a question actually. Um, I don't know how easy it is to answer because it might involve more costs to a company's infrastructure. But I think, I don't know, uh, Again, I'm still new in this, right? So uh, I don't know how much of uh, how, how feasible this is, but I was thinking, how about isn't there a way to build a system where um, where you have two separate sets of 
systems. One that is completely unconnected to the internet, where you have your most important stuff and things like that. And then the other one, um, you know, where you're, because you have to have access to the internet. You cannot be disconnected. You have to have a, a you know, web presence and all that. And you have to have, you know, communications. So my question is, two, uh, three, actually, does that system exist? Which I think it does, because uh, you mentioned something about that during the water plant uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, number two, how cost effective is that, uh, or how feasible, economically speaking, that is? Because you know, a company with huge, huge infrastructure, uh, how much money are they going to spend on that? Or so, is it doable in the first place? And the, the third one is, I think the trick is going to be how to connect or, you know, at some point you're going to need information from this ultra-reliable secrets, you know, not connected uh, segment to the other one that faces the outside. How mm -hmm. you're going to exchange that information. Is there, mm -hmm. is there something already in place like that? Well, you're asking a real big question. So uh, I, I'm, I cannot justify that with a you know, quick answer, but your your point is well taken. Uh, but let's look at reasons why it may be challenging to do that. And I'm I'm going to use just one particular example. Let's say there is a particular computer type. Let's say Mac uh, that is not allowed on your production network. You're not certified for Macs. But somebody has a Mac that they need because they are building promotional materials and Macs excel at graphics um, mm -hmm. manipulation. So you then say, all right, the only way that you can use your Mac is to have it physically segregated from the network. Okay, that's really good when you get started, but what happens when the software is updated? What happens when you've got a new version of this new Mac whatever software? And the person that's using it says, I, I need that new version. Are you going to go buy CDs or DVDs and walk them into that room and install them there? Or are you going to do what's easier and, you know, connect them on a thumb drive or, you know, connect them momentarily to the Internet to pull that stuff down. You know, that's where you get into risk analysis on what you're doing. And I'm just using that as an example. There are uh, critical systems, including the SCADA system that we talked about with the water treatment plant, that are by definition supposed to be disconnected from the Internet. But as we saw, that was not the case with this particular water treatment plant. So it was poor implementation and poor training that was the vulnerability. The SCADA systems are not supposed to be interconnected to the Internet because somebody could go in and you know turn a valve and you don't know about it. So uh, in, in short, Doug, uh, it... It sounds easy, but it's very challenging to actually implement something like that. Mm. Chris, any comments? Um, the only thing I can think about, and I kind of kind of cringe when you sat there and said the software updates. Do you get a USB and all that? You need to think of it from a business standpoint. And here's the more ethical. And, and if I talk more about it, I kind of leak into things I don't really want to talk about on a yep. public network. Um, if you want to run a business, you have to be careful of licensing. And mm -hmm. you can't just sit there and update for the sake of update without seeing, first, how it affects your network. Second, do you have the purchasing rights for it and not just copying it left and right onto a network in a shared drive? with other computers, you have to go and talk to Apple and say, hey, uh, I have one computer only. I'm only going to pay for one license, and that's it. I'm not going to share it on the network. I'm not going to do that, and Apple will give the thumbs up, or Apple will go, well, wait a minute here. You're going to do what? 
oh, okay, it's going to cost you a little bit more kind right. of situation. Mm-hmm. And that's all I can really talk about without violating ethics here. Yep. So. Adobe mm-hmm. licensing, for example, right now, Adobe is going to a per-person licensing uh, model, which means you have to log in to Adobe, which means your workstation must be able to connect back to adobe.com so it will negotiate your license at the Mm -hmm. time you decide to use the Adobe software. Mm -hmm. So you can't be disconnected and use anything but old Adobe that doesn't use that, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it takes a a lot of analysis before you decide to to fully um, uh, segregate a particular capability or, or data. Yeah, I, I kind of imagine that. That's why I mentioned it as, uh, you know, something that I was thinking hard how how you would accomplish something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, also the fact, uh, like you both mentioned uh, some drive, and I also remember some drive, what I think what, what was used, uh, that was the tool that was used for the Iran plant, uh, the... Um, Stuck so, yeah, you just, yeah. I mean, you, you'll find somebody. I mean, more than likely, who is willing to do something like that. Right. Um, so yeah, no, I know. I've, I've been thinking really hard about that. But I mean, there's probably no one. Even even if you could create something like that, the bad guys will figure something else. I think. Yeah. No. Yep. So you, you've got to think from a white hat perspective. Um, and everybody around you may be black hats. You know, mm-hmm. you're looking at something saying, how do I make it better? Somebody else is looking at it saying, how do I get into it? Mm-hmm. Same training, same approach. You guys may have literally sat side by side in the same work center, but you are ethically driven and they are not. Scotty. And ethics are very hard to define. Yes. A uh, question for you, but it can move to the chat because I see it's channel three. No. Uh, is it okay to learn the black hat way just as a strategy mm. standpoint? Yes. Yes, as long you as have you don't to cross know. that line into actually doing the black hat. That's correct. But if you if you see what they're doing and you go, oh, they're doing this. Yep. Uh, I want to do this on the white hat side. Sure. Like say. Block port uh, 1534. I'm making some stuff up. Sure. But, sure. Um, it, that's closer from an ethical standpoint if you want to go ahead and learn from the black hat standpoint. Absolutely. There's, there's gray hat hacking too, which is pretty much saying, hey, look, um, I want to learn both sides for the sake of good, mm-hmm. which is more white hat, but you also want to learn the black hat arts too. Sure. Um, I will use a, a very, very old World War II analogy. Mm-hmm. Um, as I remember, and I saw this in a movie, but I think it occurred in real life, um, when George Patton went against, and I think it was um, Field Marshal Rommel, and his tanks were against his tanks, something occurred, and Patton won the battle, and one of the things he yelled was, I read your book. In other words, I knew what you were going to do because you wrote down what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. George Patton said, I read your book, and that's what caused the Allies to win over the Germans. So, yes, you should study the, the black arts. But don't go engaging in it, you know, just for fun or, oh, I just just want to try it. You know, who cares about this particular, you know, it's just a grocery store. No, that's where you cross the ethical boundary and you are affecting somebody's livelihood and enterprise. Mm -hmm. And that's when you step into the black hat area. Okay. So basically the intention, yeah. Sure. Uh, One last thing. I keep saying that. One last thing. Let's uh, zero trust. I wanted to cover that one to make sure that we had uh, something uh, in reference to the uh, link that I forwarded. This is NSA's recommendation. It's a good read. I do suggest that everybody take a look at it. But the very first one, it says, never trust, always verify. 
In other words, you you know what somebody says, what keeps you up at night? You cannot presume that the infrastructure works, the people are good, you know, whatever. You can't use that as your basis for understanding. You must always start from a position of, I will believe it when you prove it to me. Always verify. And then you assume a breach. Love that. You, you <laughs> assume that you are already compromised. How would you discover it? How would you remediate it? Etc. Always be scanning because, um, you know, it, you've got to know what it looks like when somebody attacks you. Deny by default and heavily scrutinize all. Yep, yep. And then the last one, verify explicitly. In other words, not just general stuff. Run a tool. Am I secure? Yes. Okay, great. I can go, you know, have my dinner now. That's, that's not it. You've got to be very explicit. Um, no tool covers everything, offensively or defensively. No tool. You, you need to learn um, a variety of tools so that you know what to watch for. Okay? All right, guys, that's all I have. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.